All right, so uh, my name is Jim Radigan. Um, I've been working on compilers and operating systems for quite a while, and I'm going to talk today about um, the address sanitizer and fuzzing as we built it into Visual Studio 2019. So right now, the number of discovered vulnerabilities in Windows code is continue to increase. So CVE, there's a public database that's computer vulnerabilities and exposures. So if you look at that, 70% of that number is memory safety. So it's still profitable to be a third person nation state hacking. So memory safety continues to dominate. This problem actually is um, underreported because not all of the problems went into this database naturally. So it's interesting to think about what will be going on this year. So what we think is that sanitizers plus fuzzing is the de facto standard for detecting memory safety issues. Now this talk is not about security only, it's really about correctness and actually helping the developer process. But the end product is if you really do a good job with compiling for the ASAN runtime and fuzzing properly, it's the only thing that in the limit really approaches complete coverage for memory safety. So before I go any further, I want to really acknowledge the folks at Google. The address sanitizer runtime is available on GitHub. Um, the team that I worked with contributed back to improve it for the Windows platform. That All of that code just went up. It's out there now. And um, this technology was done by Google uh, circa 2012, I think, is when that paper was. And that was done at a Usenix conference. And the principal, uh, the principal author, the first name there, is somebody who actually worked directly with me to help me in being able to uh, reverse engineer how to do this. There are no specs for how to implement this in the compiler and the code generation, and there are no specs for the binary interface for the address sanitizer runtime. So it was really nice. We gave back code, and they helped us with the compiler and being able to figure out the binary APIs. So that's a special call out to Konstantin, who was extremely helpful, and he was the principal author on that paper. I think right now he's leading a team of uh, 13 people at Google, and there's another six or seven people that are working on client and LVM associated with that team uh, for doing the uh, sanitizer work for Windows. So today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about correctness, uh, the ASAN code generation and fuzzing, and then the development process. So the first question is, what's wrong with the slide? OK, I just want to make sure everybody's watching. So the, the hard part here is, um, what is correctness? Why is it so confusing? Why is it so hard? Why is everybody exploiting this issue? And it, it's, it's really not hard if you begin to look around at what the tools are. So right there, those are 31 static analysis tools that are available today, 31. Each one of them covers a different area. Each one of them will parse a subset of C and C++. And they all come with their own set of problems. And that's static analysis. That's where you take the source code and you try to analyze statically with data flow and traditional methods what, what problems are in your program that might cause a buffer overflow or a use after free, et cetera. If you look at the binary, at the binary level, there are quite a few uh, Windows tools. Dr. Memory is something that's really pretty popular that's on that list. And then on Linux, there's an, an entire ecosystem that's built on top of Valgrind. And that's all done at the binary level. So now you explain 
that list to your manager, and then you explain this list to your manager, and now you understand why it's confusing, because even the binary, if you look at the list of capabilities that the binary analysis tools do, is they're all over the place, they're all different. So uh, what I'm gonna try to do is narrow it down and define correctness for you explicitly. So the real core problem for analysis is pointers and types. And the, the only thing that external binaries do is they exacerbate both those problems. So I'm gonna ease into it, it's really easy, the upper left quadrant for you. If P alias is A or B, then you can see that A plus B is not a redundant sub-expression. So you can begin to see the, the idea of aliasing. And now if you go down to the lower left quadrant, you can see if you, that Q might alias O, and as a result, I wouldn't have a clue what that virtual function call is actually gonna be. So now, pointer analysis begins to uh, make it very hard to do full analysis through the call trees, because you don't know what indirect function calls are gonna be going to unless you understand what the types are. So now if you look at type propagation, it affects the alias analysis. So if I don't know what that is pointing to, I can't de-virtualize it or I can't look through it, then I have no idea what's gonna happen when I dereference the global pointer. So to make this more concrete, that's, a, that's a, an ordinary diagram of a, a pointer to an object and then the object has a pointer to its v-table. So all the way over on the left, if you don't know what that type is and you're doing any kind of static analysis, you really don't know what that table is on the right, on the far right. So this is the visual I hope you can walk away with. It's really simple. Alias analysis towards type propagation and then type propagation towards alias analysis. It's a really tight cycle and that's why correctness is hard in terms of analysis, okay? So I'm gonna transition now and talk about the address sanitizer, which eliminates that cycle. So when we say address sanitizer, it's really an overloaded term. It's a lot of stuff. So at its core, there are two major components. There's the compiler, which generates code in a, in a, in a special mode that targets interop with the Google ASAN runtime. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> and then the runtime itself is designed to do several things, but the compiler calls into the runtime to report errors, and also the runtime will actually hook many of your libraries. It'll actually get in there like malware. So the compiler will instrument code, lay out the stack, and it will call into the runtime. The compiler also generates an enormous amount of metadata in the object for the runtime, so that when the runtime is, is detecting an error for you because you've called into it, it can actually do a really great analysis and discern the type of error based on the metadata that the compiler has supplied. So the sanitizer runtime acts like malware, it'll get in there and it'll hook malloc free and memset, I've got a, a visual for that. It does a, a really great job on the error analysis. It, one of the things that's really great for interop is you don't have to recompile everything that your application interops with. And then the real money statement is there's zero false positives, which is wildly different than a lot of the static analysis. So you're combining a lot of work in the compiler, you're running your program, and you're interopping with the address sanitizer runtime to do a complete coverage of all the problems that you hit. Okay, so we are in the Denver Broncos zip code. So this is a quiz, and I brought this for whoever gets the right answer, okay? I picked this up at the airport because I knew there'd be Denver people here. So when does that pro program uh, blow up? When do you see an error? 
When is it visible? That's right, there's a problem. Logically, it's incorrect. The less than or equal to size is when you hit equal size, right, it's gonna still iterate and you're gonna exceed the number of bytes that were malloced. That's true, but let's assume that buffer is the right size. It turns out, did you want to take a shot? That's true. So this is secure by coincidence. If buffer comes in and it's the right size, then what will happen is two things. This will actually, this program, if buffer is the right size, it's what you, where you think that buffer is one less than the, the iteration of that loop. Um, it won't manifest an error until, unless size is zero mod 16, and that has to do with the implementation of malloc. There's slop. So when you malloc size, it gets rounded up to zero mod 16. So if you go one past that, this will work perfectly fine. So it's, there's only an observable error if the following page is unmapped and not writable, or an observable error will fire when you use the corrupted data. All other cases are silent. So what's really great about this is that ASAN will help you with this type of error. The runtime hooks malloc, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. And here, I want to pass that. You're, you're the one who came the closest on the buffer. Wasn't that you? It was you? Could... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I was making slides on the airplane, so I got that wrong. But really what happens here is that um, the runtime will hook malloc, and then the compiler will instrument the store. And it, that what'll, what's really important, too, is that um, the, the combination of the code gen and interop with the runtime It'll catch it immediately on the, before you actually do the store, and it'll give you an exact uh, error message. So what's behind all of this, and I'm not going to go into it because it's readily available on, on the internet, and Clang and LLVM have had this for a while, and now GCC has it. But what's behind the, the whole um, idea for the address sanitizer is you can take any address in your application and you can map it to a shadow byte. So eight bytes in your address space will map to one byte in the shadow byte area. And that's the formula that'll do it. You just shift right and add that constant, and that's a reserved part of memory that the runtime and the compiler will uh, write to and read from as a way of understanding what's happening with every byte in your application space. So literally, that's what the code generation is going to be like. And F8 just means a use after free, or a use after scope, I mean. So one shadow byte will describe eight bytes. And so if it's a positive number, zero through seven, that means that many bytes starting in that zero mod eight address are accessible at that moment. If it's a negative number, in the shadow byte, then you can use it to encode problems. So F8 is a state, and then the left, right, and mid-red zones are ways of framing your data so that when there is a problem, the runtime and the compiler can interop and diagnose exactly what it is. So what'll happen is the compiler will take your statement on the left, and it'll conceptually generate code like that on the right. So that store 
we'll check it. We'll check the shadow byte for that stored through P, and then the code will say if the shadow byte is inappropriate for that size at that time, we'll call into the ASAN runtime. It'll look at the shadow bytes. It'll look at your stack. It'll look at the metadata, and it'll tell you an exact error. So these are shadow bytes for what might be two variables on the stack. That's the left red zone, 0xf1. That's a mid red zone. We actually space the variables out on the stack. And then the right red zone is like a terminator. So you can see that these, these shadow bytes would mean that you've got a 16 byte stack local and an eight byte stack local. So now, if you were to actually do the check and give it an address and a size, and we read that F2, we would know that you had overflowed the buffer. And the compiler would generate code as something goes out of scope to slam an F8 in that shadow byte so that if a subsequent read came, you would know that you were reading a value that was out of lexical scope. That's a simple diagram to explain most of the workings of the, of the address sanitizer. So I'm going to talk about now the runtime. So that's just representing a call to malloc. And then that other big box is meant to be the body of code for malloc. And what the ASAN runtime does upon initialization is it comes in and it hooks that. It's malware. It's, that's exactly what malware does. It comes in, it takes the first five bytes out of malloc, puts them over here in the ASAN malloc, executes them, does work in ASAN for being able to uh, keep track of pointers, what you malloc and their size, and then it'll jump back to the original malloc after those five bytes and continue to do the regular functionality. That's just malware. But it does that for a lot of stuff. It'll do it for malloc and free, new and delete, mem set, mem copy, all the, all the things that you would use in the CRT for manipulating memory and a few other areas. Now, this is a diagram or a, a screenshot that I saved to give you an idea of how early and pervasive this thing is. So if we zoom in there, you can begin to see a, a call stack. The runtime actually gets in front of your application, and then this is the call stack that it, it's running to actually initialize memory, the shadow byte memory. So it, is, it gets in front of your application. It hooks the runtime. It actually hooks parts of um, the executive, and um, then it, it finally runs your code, which has been fully instrumented by the compiler. So Clang does it, GCC does it, Apple has this for their, their applications. So why did we do it at Microsoft? So Microsoft has had a C compiler around since 1982, so you can only imagine how much legacy code we have. So I looked around for some of the gnarliest legacy code I could find that would fit on a screen to show a really great example. So this is some C++ com that we are able to compile now with the Microsoft compiler. And it's basically creating um, events. It's creating objects. And what happens is these objects are created and they're freed. And so on one part of the runtime keeps track of did you, how much did you allocate and how much did you free. So you can see there's an event, uh, source, there's source one event uh, six and source one event seven. So those objects get created and they get freed. And this is what the output was from running that one com example. The address sanitizer caught an error that the new and, there was a new and delete type mismatch. So the size of the object that was allocated did not match the size of the object that was freed. 
and that was source one, event six, and source one, event seven. And this was not a bug in the application. It was a bug in our front end that had been in the compiler for over seven years. That's how powerful it was. So what really has to happen is you've got to pair compiling with the address sanitizer with fuzzing. And I, I know that fuzzing is a term that not a lot of people have heard before, so I'm gonna just quickly give you an overview of what it is. So fuzzing is a way to automatically generate inputs to your program to blow it up. So there are programs that, and services that will generate random inputs, millions of them, to, and send them into your program. So on the left-hand side is a piece of source code in C++. As you notice, it's just linear, it's lexical. What happens internally in the compiler is that we turn that into a flow graph, a two-dimensional representation. And the key point in going from the one-dimensional source representation on the left to the flow graph model on the right is that you can see paths of execution. And if you look, what I've done is I've put a check in the mem copy. That's what the address sanitizer, uh, compiling for the address sanitizer will do. It'll actually check that mem copy. So now what's important is you wanna make sure when you run this program that the program takes that red path. So fuzzing will ensure that red paths with checks all execute. So if you throw a massive number of inputs to, you, to your program and you keep track of what's being executed, you can make sure that you get complete code coverage and you can get all the paths that will lead to a failure. So there's black box fuzzing and this is a really simple example of it just permutes. So the first line up there is what we call a seed and well, what the service will do is it will permute this until you get to stack overflow. And I'm doing this example with the assumption that, let's say you wrote a program and it blew up when your input was in fact stack overflow. So fuzzing would permute, permute, and boom, there's where you would get the exception. And this can be turned into an algorithm. It's really pretty straightforward. And I just put this algorithm in there just for reference later on. Now the idea of a seed can actually be really complex. What's important about the seed is it, it gives it some notion of structure so the program you've written uh, won't blow up just because you can't simply parse something. And it also is close to what would be permutable to lead to an error. So in this particular case, this is a real story. It was kind of interesting. If you look at this paper, it's a scanned uh, PDF file. This is built one of Bill Gates' first papers. And why this is interesting is because this was actually a seed for fuzzing a PD, an open source PDF reader. And it was the most effective input, and nobody knows why, for blowing up this PDF reader. It's kind of spooky. In fact, the guy who did his PhD um, on this type of fuzzing used that in his dissertation. And, he said, and when they brought this service up at Microsoft, it was one of their first test cases. So what is a, a fuzzing service? Well, at Microsoft, it's called the Microsoft Security Risk Detection Service. And it scales in the cloud, it bundles a tremendous number of fuzzers, it does web scanning, it actually will fuzz RESTful APIs, and it has a applications of AI and white box fuzzing that I'll show a, a quick diagram on. I don't want you to get um, wrapped up in trying to understand it, I just want you to know this is available and it's a very powerful service. And finally, this is the white box uh, fuzzing. It, one of the things that's really interesting here is that we combine technologies from um, what we call time travel debugging, where you can actually take a trace while you're running and record 
the execution and actually go back in time in the debugger, but I'll talk about that some other time. Right now, those traces are being used to help with fuzzing. And I don't want this to be too complex, but the, the code on the left is just basically four if statements. And if you get the string BAD exclamation point, you'll get to the crash. And so what happens is the traces that are recorded allow the fuzzing service to find the exact if statements in the code and then figure out how to build a symbolic constraint system and flip the, the execution so that those ifs are taken and not taken. So what happens is the fuzzing of this is extremely efficient. So what happens is you turn fuzzing into a constraint solver. So the initial input for this is good and then through solving the constraints and iterating, eventually you get to the far right, you get the string bad, and that program will blow up. If you were to use a black box fuzzer, you won't get there. So one last topic, and then I'll move on. But the important thing to know about fuzzing is where you have data trust boundaries. So that's anywhere input is coming into your program from the outside world. And this is a great example. In this particular case, you'd want to simulate, the, or the service will actually simulate for you random input coming in through the input stream that you're calling a socket. And then what's really important is buffer. So buffer is something that you want to look at after this loop to make sure it's used in places that are at least deep in the call stack. And that's a heuristic for automatically generating another type of fuzzing or to actually subsection your program. But that's beyond the scope. So what I want to do is just pull up really quick and basically make the statement that compiling for ASAN plus fuzzing is self-diagnosing. So if you add all the instrumentation and then you randomize the inputs over and over, the instrumentation will catch all the failures and it'll diagnose it for you. If you don't compile it with ASAN, you randomize all those inputs, you're going to be reading a lot of segmentation faults, bus errors, a lot of OS things, and it'll be a lot harder to debug it. So the really important thing is that compiling it for ASAN really reduces the conceptual load. So you can throw this at the cloud and fuzz it. And then as you fuzz it, you can take that information back and you got a really, really productive developer inner loop. So the development process, what we want is people to incorporate ASAN and fuzzing. It's really, really important. That's why I'm here and I'm going to talk about the tools and the workflow that we have. So this is a picture of something that I think transcends all languages and nationalities. What icon do you think this stands for in agile terminologies? Well, of course, that's workflow. So usually what happens is the guy on the right finds the bugs, and then the guy on the left is the one who fixes the bugs. And that's what we're going to talk about. So our workflow that we're going to talk about is compiling your application. I'm going to show this in the demo. And then we're going to fling it at 40 cores in the cloud. And then we're going to have to process the failures. So that last line is what's really, really hard. OK? So those three lines, what does that look like? So we'll start on a laptop. You've got Visual Studio 2019. You've got the compiler in the runtime. And you've got a new IDE. And then there's the cloud. That's, sorry, that's maybe not the best illustration, but that's 40 cores in the cloud. So now you're going to fling your program over to 40 cores. That in and of itself is a really difficult thing. You've got to procure the machines. You've got to have the account. You've got to get your package together, which contains your executable and your tests and the seeds for the fuzzing. And we automate all that for you. Then what will happen is after you've run the programs in the cloud for a while, things will blow up. And what the service will do for you is it will take all of those failures, it will bucket them, and it will create unique instances that are reproducible.
It'll also save what we call snapshot files, which is another new functionality that we're going to have with Visual Studio. And I'll talk about that in a second with a visual. Now that service will actually send back to you a text message saying that you have a failure. And you can actually click on that and get all the way back to the cloud and immediately start <laughs> debugging a unique error. So the service will then finally take the unique errors, put them on a machine outside the firewall, and it will allow you to then connect to that machine to debug it remotely. So in essence, what happens is with Visual Studio and the service that we have in the cloud, the user only looks at this. It only really sees, it gets a, the user only sees that you get a message, you have an error, and then you can opt into debugging it remotely immediately. And that's the workflow that I'm going to demo. So we got to get from that output, which that's the command line output for a uh, use after scope, to being able to make it usable as a tool to move bits around and interop with the cloud. So that is a snapshot file. That's a new structure that we're going to introduce. It really was a game changer. We, we showed this to some people at um, other companies. And they, they were really excited about this, because this just it, it changes the way you would even report a bug. So that's a file. It's a dump file that's actually produced from a special uh, process that Windows has. It's a snapshot process. And what that does have is a copy of your virtual mappings and no executable code. And so what can happen is we can actually dump that right away into a file. And we can also put metadata in it. And what we've done is make the IDE parse that metadata. So with one snapshot file, you have a completely described bug, exactly like that. If you open this file up in Visual Studio, you don't need any text description for what the bug is. You got zero false positives. This can be re reproduced immediately. You've got your call stack. You have everything in the, that was in the heap space. And it's pointing exactly at where the error occurred. So people at these companies want to use these as um, the de facto way of actually reporting any kind of a bug. Now, what's interesting in this is that we've put hyperlinks in that non-modal dialog box on the top. And they're live. You can actually click on those, and it'll get you back into the cloud. OK? So here's where I do the demo. I'm going to actually demo that workflow. So here's a little uh, program. And I'm going to make it blow up so that Oh. No. There it is. All right. Here's a here's an example program. And I highlighted one line of code. And when it finds the exact substring heap overflow, it's going to blow up. I just made it a simple program so that you would actually see that the seeds make sense and the execution is going to lead to a failure pretty quickly. OK, so if, you, if we accurately parse any of those phrases, it'll take us into code that'll, that'll blow up. So, in this example, here are the seed files. So for example, there's the seed stuck overflow. It'll start with that seed. The fuzzing service will permute that. And eventually, that program will parse stack overflow. And we should blow up. 
There it is, right there. So that's one seed. So now what I'm going to show you here is we're going to take this program, we're going to compile it. We've got a JSON file that's here that's going to be stuck in a package, and we're going to fling it at 40, core, 40 cores in the cloud. So I click here. I'm going to rebuild. Now, if you watch the bottom pane, there's the output. It's in flight right now. It's compiling the program. And now it's creating the zip file that's going to fling at the cloud. And that's the JSON file that got put in there that tells the MSRD service exactly what to do, what are the seeds for fuzzing. And boom, it flung it at the cloud, and it popped up a, a web interface for me to actually go inspect the jobs that are already there. Sorry. So there's my job right there. That's an overview of what it was. And if I go up here, We can see that right there, I'm initializing the job. That's the job we just created. And I'm going to get 40 machines. And what I've done is I pre-baked some other jobs in here so that we could actually see the other side of this demo where you see all the failures. OK? So take a leap of faith with me for a second. And. I'm sitting there minding my own business, and I get a bug report with a heart saying that they want me to fix this bug right away, and it's in the cloud. Now, what will happen is, in that service, when you get an error and it's unique, it will package it up in a bug for you already in our Azure DevOps database, and it will send it to you in a link, in a text message, and in there, you'll be able to get back to the snapshot file that I talked to you about. And I'll show you that right now. So I'm going to go click on my failure. Here's the bug. The service filed this for you automatically. You didn't have to do anything. And then down there is the compressed snapshot file. We have to get them smaller than they are right now, so we're compressing them, but we didn't, do the, we didn't do the work in time for that. So what I'm going to do is download the compressed snapshot file live from the cloud where that failure is. Now what's going to happen is I'm just going to open up that snapshot file in Visual Studio. And boom, there's your bug report. You don't have to do anything. So the snapshot file had all the metadata shoved into it when it crashed to allow the IDE to organize all this information for you right away. And so what you can see is, here's your call. The, First in this, this window, you can see this is the output from the ASAN runtime telling you what the, that's the raw data coming out of the runtime, which is a little, little bit uh, much if you want to move fast. That's why we've actually created that non-modal dialog box to actually interpret the results for you right at that source line. Otherwise, you would just have the command line that's in this output skew below, on the right. And then there's the shadow byte that the runtime, if you see it in the, with the arrow and it's an FA, that's the shadow byte that allowed the runtime to figure out what the error was. And now, if you look at this and you want to debug this, you can actually click on the link there. So with this link, you can go back and actually look at 
the fuzzing results of all your jobs that were related to this. If you want to, with this link, where the mouse is right now, you can actually RDP into the exact machine where this is to actually do manual things if you would like. Or right here, what you can do is you can connect to that machine, and when you do, what it's going to do is bring you up in your application at main <coughs> in the debugger. You'll start right in main. Boom. There you are. So now, if you look, you're on a machine in the cloud, and if you look, that's the call stack with just my code, but if I switch the mode here, there's the true call stack, and you can see that we broke in main. We're not at the error. We haven't failed yet. So you can actually, at this point, remotely F10 or single step. And if you want, from this point, you can hit F5 to continue, and we will run to the failure. Boom. There you go. And there's your call stack on the right. And I think the output window will have, yeah. So the output window will have the same spew now. So what's really cool is if you wanted right now with this on the screen, fully diagnosed, ready to go, you can actually go up here and you can start a live session. There you go. So what, right now, I've got, I've got a link on my clipboard that I could actually put into a uh, Teams message and somebody could join me and they could start interactively debugging this. So the other thing that I wanted to just quickly point to was if I go to this service, you can actually from that same window Go back and get the status of all your jobs. And one of the things that's really interesting here is that you can see this particular job has been run 25 million times for you. And out of the 25 million times, it's had over 7,000 exceptions thrown. And that's a progress bar down there. So what you get automatically when you fling it is 40 cores. They'll run for about five days. And you'll get free, free machines that you can actually uh, attach to immediately to debug. Now, you can actually drill in further. You can actually see all of the properties that were sent over and set up the job. And then if you want, you can drill into the job results and you can actually take a look. At all the states. And if you wanted to, you see we got all five of them from the fuzzing. We got the double free, the global buffer overflow, the heap buffer overflow, heap use after free, and stack buffer overflow, all memory safety issues. So, That's pretty much all I wanted to show quickly. I'm almost out of time, and I wanted to make it really clear this fuzzing service is available to anybody right now. If you just send mail to fuzzing at Microsoft.com, you can get started immediately for free. We're offering that to everybody who's here today. And then the compiler and the IDE didn't make it into preview one. It's, it's in now the, into our, our product branch, so it's going to be in uh, preview two which means it'll be available in um, second week of November. So all of this is just about there. We really, really encourage you to 
think about the importance of this technology and how Visual Studio is going to make it really turnkey for you. So any questions? Um, first, I want to say, like, as somebody who's been using um, ASAN and fuzzing for a long time on non-Windows platforms, um, for the benefit of people who maybe haven't had that benefit, this is probably, in my opinion, one of the most significant th things that Microsoft has done in probably a decade. So thank you. It really is like amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, actually. Um, I wanted to ask, like, what's the performance overhead of this? Like, if I were running this, like, say, not in the cloud, but if I were running this, my, my test suite, which takes however much time, like, if I were to instrument it with ASAN and run it, how, how much longer can I expect it to take? A rule of thumb is, like, just 2x, which is a lot better than Valgrind, which is, like, 10x. OK. But there are certain things that, depending on what your, your usage patterns are, it, 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 it's surprisingly a lot less. And we've made the compiler run so that it'll compile OD, O2, or with whole program analysis. So a lot of times what uh, you wouldn't expect is that optimization will actually take out code that had vulnerabilities in it and checks. So okay. your, val your, your mileage varies. OK. Um, my other question is, um, I know you're giving us like all this amazing stuff, and I'm about to ask for a lot more. But um, what about like UbiSan and MSan and LSan and Thread Sanitizer and like all these other amazing sanitizers? So part of uh, uh, UbiSan is on by default in this implementation. Okay. In fact, one of the bugs that was in here was found with the UbiSan component. That was when I showed you that legacy code that blew up. Um, we are, uh, right now, there are three other things that are in the pipe that I'm trying to cherry pick from the other sanitizers to put in here. Okay. Um, the first one that's going to show up is what we call uh, uh, cast guard. So we're going to actually check every cast in your program. OK, cool. So it sounds like we can expect to see these other sanitizer features maybe someday. Oh, uh, very soon. Because one of the things, uh, there, there are at least three or four other uh, memory sanitizer and thread, thread safety. Those are the two that are really, really important. But they have some limitations. They have in the current, the way they're implemented currently. So like MSAM requires you compile everything. So like, you know, um, parts of the Windows executive would have to be compiled. So we're going to work around that, though. OK, thanks. Thank you. Um, going back to your black box uh, fuzzing algorithm, how do you determine what is a good seat? Uh, what you do is you take a, a, just a, an example of input that usually you had before for your tests. and. It'll, it'll take that, like, you know, I showed the PDF scan from Bill Gates' paper. That was it. It just took that, and then it randomly poked pixels in the scan document, and it blew up the, the, the PDF reader. Okay, thank you. I was say, I love the, uh, the jump into the code, you know, debugging session, see where the error is immediately. Um, I'm wondering what kind of support you have for, like, source control, like, if I build something on a branch that for fuzzing, I throw it up there, I get an error report, I go back a day later, I'm on a different branch, you know, how, how much support is there going to be for Visual Studio to figure that out and go back to the code that was generated? Yeah, what we're going to do is add the ability to have the SHA-1 hashes from the source. So you'll get a package, one of the things that'll be in the JSON blob that goes over to the cloud will actually be a SHA-1 hash for your your repo. So I guess my question is, will it be able to integrate with like Team Explorer and automatically switch back to the branch that correlates with the code that was built to generate what was thrown up to the cloud? I, I got to be honest, I didn't think about that. That's a great idea. And so, uh, yeah, no, that really is. I, 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 uh, so with Clang, you'd add F sanitize to your command line flags. How do I turn this on in, in Visual Studio? Is that in the property pages or? Uh... Yeah, it's going to be available as an experimental release. And when you actually say you want to opt into address sanitizer, it'll be thrown on the command line for you right away in the project system. And the command line, it'll uh, look exactly as when you use Clang and LVM. Okay. Is that in the current um, latest 2019 preview? Or is it a future preview that we'll see this? Uh, It'll be available second week of November. OK. The problem with this is that testing this is really hard. You have to test not only that regular code runs, but also when you find an error that there are zero false positives. And so when you start finding lots of errors that you didn't expect, like in our own test suites, we found over 300 errors that have been 
used to compile the compiler for you know forever and uh, to test the compiler. I mean, and uh, got to go through every one of them and verify that they're not false. That's one of the beauties of the tool is the, is the zero false positives. All right. Hey, thanks for your time. Sorry for the slow setup.